Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today for our uh, March Source Partner Panel. We're really excited to have some excellent speakers with us today to talk about opportunities for getting involved um, with housing, homelessness efforts, and other related advocacy efforts. Before we jump into it, um, my name is Katie Nelson. I'm a program assistant for SOURCE. Really excited to be moderating this session today. I'd like to start with a few acknowledgements. We, respect, we respectfully acknowledge and give thanks to the Piscataway uh, tribe, including the Piscataway Kanoi tribe of Maryland and the Cedarville Band of Piscataway, the indigenous people who are traditional owners of the land of the Chesapeake Bay region. We also acknowledge all indigenous people, the traditional owners of the lands and waters of the United States of America. We also want to acknowledge the impact that racist systemic oppression, including the practice of redlining has on the lives of black and brown folks in Baltimore and beyond. A little bit about SOURCE. Um, our mission at SOURCE is to engage the Johns Hopkins University Health Professional Schools and Baltimore communities in mutually beneficial partnerships that promote health and social justice through our key values, which include reciprocity, justice, service, and collaboration. And without further ado, we have two great speakers today, and I think we might be waiting on our speaker from Dayspring, but I'm going to turn it over to Ruth Ann Norton from Green and Healthy Homes Initiative to just tell us a little bit about the work that they do, um, as well as opportunities for students and faculty to get involved. So Ruth Ann, take it away. Great. Uh, so good to be with you. Uh, Green and Healthy Homes Initiative, just for everybody's uh, background, was founded actually in 1986 by nine parents whose children were highly poisoned and uh, in the um, intensive care unit in Hopkins, actually, uh, who lived in the 800 and 900 block of North Washington Street, which is right behind the Bloomberg School of Public Health. At that time, they set out a mission uh, to ensure that no other child uh, would be harmed uh, from the impact of lead uh, and unhealthy housing. We've carried that mission forward. Uh, we describe our work as addressing the social determinants of health and racial equity uh, through the creation of healthy housing. Um, and the organization uh, has evolved uh, from that volunteer effort in the late 80s and early 90s to today being the largest nonprofit organization focused on environmental and racial justice through healthy housing and the largest healthy housing organization in the country. And we do some highly sophisticated work around healthcare uh, uh, dollar uh, value uh, valuations of, of projects. And we work uh, literally in all 50 states around the country, uh, bringing together the sectors of healthcare, uh, healthy housing, and the environment. And I think uh, currently, one of the things I'd like to talk to you about is, uh, well, two things. Uh, one, in Baltimore, we provide direct services uh, to create healthy housing, provide legal services, relocation, case management, and advocacy. One of the highlights of our current work in Baltimore is that we're launching a thousand home effort in East Baltimore uh, that we will make uh, energy efficient, uh, decarbonize electrification will be part of that work, uh, removing asthma triggers, lead, and improving uh, structural defects that cause trip and fall injuries. And we're doing this because we want to ensure that where kids lay their heads down at night, uh, it is a place from which they can thrive and they can get to the classroom healthy, ready to learn, earn, and compete for a lifetime, not be lead poisoned, not be in the emergency room for asthma, but instead redirecting dollars upstream to create stable, healthy environments, but also to ensure that our older adults, um, especially in our black and brown communities and our under-resourced communities, which is where the you know, HHI uh, spends 100% of its work uh, is that we are creating environments that older adults can age with dignity um, and create intergenerational wealth transfer by improving uh, the value of housing to be able 
uh, to be uh, kept in families. One of the markers of uh, equity is included in that intergenerational wealth transfer that we're looking at. So we are going to be launching a number of uh, positions and needs around uh, the measurement of uh, racial equity impact that the project's going to have here in Baltimore but in six other cities around the country that we will be doing this uh, simultaneous investment in a uh, thousand unit projects in Chicago, Detroit, Pittsburgh, Philadelphia, Cleveland, and Toledo. And looking at that for major system reform, um, uh, incorporated in this also is work that we're doing around the country in um, many areas beyond the seven cities, um, and including in our site in Memphis, is looking at the impact of decarbonization and electrification as part of healthy housing and its impact on health and economics for low-income communities. So in our work, uh, we are really trying to drive uh, the national efforts uh, at the federal level, looking to help uh, mayors, uh, how they will spend not only infrastructure dollars, but ARPA dollars on uh, improving the health of occupied housing. We think it's one of the most important and critical issues for tangible and transformational investments as a start of a way to make reparations to under-resourced communities, but to ensure better futures. And, uh, but also at the state and local level. So the work of GHHI has evolved uh, from a lead poisoning prevention uh, group in the early 90s to really looking at the holistic health of housing, its impact on jobs, its impact on education, its impact on wealth retention, uh, and clearly uh, overall health. As I was saying to Katie at the, right before we started, we will have five openings uh, for fellows this uh, year, uh, focusing on lead, climate, asthma, uh, and holistic housing. Um, and we hope that SOAR students will look at that. We also have ongoing uh, project opportunities looking at our, how we measure racial equity, our measurements on uh, how we're building holistic housing programs, not only in Baltimore, uh, but around the country. And um, we, at, we need at a core level always um, help volunteers and uh, internships in our civic engagement here in Baltimore uh, building out our environmental justice work uh, that we, uh, we have an opening for that on an EPA grant right now and our general work around uh, our uh, unit uh, housing intervention work beyond the thousand units. We are gonna be doing a couple of thousand more in our general services. Um, so I would love for you to get to know more about GHHI. I'd love to answer questions around our work but I do think it has been one of the most impactful uh, programs in the city uh, over the last uh, several decades. Uh, one of our hallmarks is that we have lowered lead poisoning by 99%, uh, but we understand that that can't be done in a vacuum uh, and has to be built into housing condition. So in short, we are trying to move that uh, moral compass on how we see uh, housing uh, as healthcare, how we see housing as environmental justice and racial justice and improve the baseline of how we invest in low income uh, communities. So I, Katie, I'd love to answer questions more than talk about the work, uh, but yeah. we've got a ton of it to do to actually accomplish our goal. And um, we would love to have you uh, talk to any other folks who've been source scholars and I will say that about 20% of our organization uh, is staffed full-time uh, by former uh, Source and Hopkins uh, volunteers that have turned into long-term employment. Oh, that's awesome. Um, I would actually, I know we have a lot of folks on the call who are actually taking a class right now on housing and homelessness. Um, in the school of public health specifically. This, so this is definitely a topic that hits home for them. If anybody has any questions, please feel free to either put them in the chat or even unmute yourself. Um, we've got a wealth of knowledge here with us, so. Well, I would say, Katie, one of the things around 
sort of this connection between uh, healthy housing and homelessness, right? We've, we've done a number of studies on both homelessness prevention and foreclosure prevention. Uh, really was highlighted uh, back when we were having the foreclosure crisis. Um, but, you know, by creating healthier housing, uh, our, we've done two HUD uh, studies for HUD, on what are called HUD technical studies, we're able to move down turnover rates and uh, eviction rates from 42% a year in our lowest income communities down to six. Uh, so really looking at housing stability, we look at it as a marker for long-term opportunity for kids, especially zero to three, zero to six, uh, looking at uh, reducing not only health impacts of lead and asthma and respiratory disease, but the trauma that's caused from the chaos, right? Uh, and one of the things that we, as I said, are building out into that is how do we take climate dollars and really bring them in as investments to engage our most under-resourced communities as a means of uh, restorative and uh, justice and reparation, but really building the climate movement in communities that have been just disregarded for generations over time. Uh, you know, we refer to it often as the black butterfly in Baltimore, where there has been redlining and racist policies for so long that we have really bankrupted people's opportunities and trying to use it as an opportunity to drive the maximum amount of resources. And the reason that we are measuring health and measuring equity is one of our main things is that we're trying to get health institutions to see it as healthcare and reinvest. So for example, we got the University of Pennsylvania to invest $50 million in Lancaster into lead removal of housing out of hospital community benefit funds because they saw the opportunity to improve equity. Cleveland Clinic just put 52 million out of hospital community benefit funds. But we're starting more and more also to get upstream investments from healthcare who understand and recognize this. ProMedica, who isn't even located in Maryland, is investing in the thousand unit project as a means of uh, health and racial equity. Uh, Amerigroup is starting to build uh, dollars into asthma reduction as part of their healthcare plan. And, we're, and in New York City, we just closed the nation's only pay, uh, transaction that we funded, GHHI was one of the investors, we funded asthma reduction uh, as a post-COVID response in the Bronx to, because we know that the impact of COVID has not only driven down lead testing rates and essential maintenance practices to protect people, but that asthma has been exacerbated in the Bronx. And it's gonna be paid back solely by Medicaid savings because the work we're doing is not only creating better home environments, but we're measuring how much Medicaid is saving by this work being done. Uh, and the last thing I will say is that one of the things that we uh, need a lot of help on, when we're trying to drive up the number of jobs that we give into the communities that have been the hardest hit, helping to build ownership of the contracting companies, not have people just be workers in the contracting companies. These are jobs that pay 50 to $65,000 a year with health benefits. Uh, risk assessors can pay up to $75,000, $80,000 a year with health benefits. And we wanna move people from just a community health worker uh, role, which is, which is good, I mean, I, 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 but to be able to have a pathway to health educator and uh, to um, uh, higher levels of employment in this work. So our goal is really to also build this effort here, not only in Baltimore, but in the cities that we work across the country, jobs, housing stability, health, and climate, and align that together. That's awesome. I love the, the link between, you know, making, prioritizing a more proactive approach within the healthcare system, but also building up capacity within communities to be able to help tackle some of these issues as well. Yeah, some of our biggest work is making sure that we're not the ones just taking and holding money, but getting mm -hmm. help to build the capacity. Yeah. Uh, uh, the, the higher level that we can continually do that, 
um, you know, to where the strength is not in us, but is mostly uh, in community. Uh, that's our goal. So we have a question um, from one of our participants or our attendees. Will there be any connections with the BCFD considering the amount of empty housing fires that have occurred in Baltimore City? You know, we've reached out to the mayor on this um, because this is uh, gets directly to the health of our housing structures, um, not only in um, ensuring that we move vacants to actually healthy housing, right? Baltimore has a program called Vacants to Values, but it needs to be healthy housing availability because you that, that gives you an opportunity of uh, placement for uh, potentially homeless populations, but families that are in crowded situations or uh, building affordable, accessible housing, but the houses that are on each side of these homes that we need to bring back to life because of, uh, what the, the risk becomes the risk for the entire block. Right. Um, we want to decarbonize. Uh, we've seen just recently in Montgomery County a huge explosion in uh, apartment complex from gas appliances. Um, it's good for the environment. It's good for respiratory health. It's good for fire safety. Uh, but we have a uh, proposal in uh, to the mayor uh, to capture some of the American Recovery Plan dollars if we're successful it will go uh, in part directly to these efforts on coordination with the fire departments and ensuring uh, that we not only uh, create uh, better housing from fire safety, but use the fire department as a means of triggering a notice uh, the, of houses that need attention, U utilizing them as uh, civic engagement in, in a system of referral. Mm. So you mentioned slowed lead testing rates, and we've seen obviously, you know, an increase in asthma exacerbations, especially with COVID. How else have you seen the pandemic influence the work that you are doing? Well, it caused us to create some uh, interesting things, virtual. Um, it, it, we really obviously strengthened our virtual outreach and work that we found is something that we will keep, that being able to do that entry conversation with families virtually, number one, has built a, str a, a strong trust connection that when we show up at a house, we're more likely to have a successful engagement on the housing intervention side. Um, and, uh, and we did do virtual assessments. They're not ever going to be as good as in the home assessments. The big challenge has been the inability to get uh, government dollars flowing back into housing intervention. So we have really tried to be available to do emergency housing work. We are now trying to move that curve back uh, to preventive work in housing. Um, but, and, and that coming with the large not number of dollars that Baltimore hopefully will capture as other cities uh, from infrastructure, right? Mm -hmm. It's gonna cause a, a, a real need to um, have effective platforms of how do we get to housing fast enough at scale to capture the moment of the money and the need. Um, that's a really big challenge, uh, but we still believe in that human connection, being able to get out in neighborhoods and understand people's problems. Um, but what it has caused us to do is look far more holistically and uh, look for the opportunities of the moment to address um, what we know, which is coming out of COVID, what's more important than the health of your home? Where, where we've seen families that have had to shelter in place for almost two years in housing that lacks essential maintenance practices, that is beset by lead hazard, mold, mildew, moisture, poor ventilation. We shouldn't ever be in that position again. We should have never been in the position to begin with. But I think it gives us a stronger advocacy platform as healthy housing as healthier. Totally. Um, all right. Well, we'll let everybody sort of sit and come up with some questions. In the in the meantime, I'd like to turn it. We have a couple student representatives from both the School Public Health Student Assembly, the DECA committee as well as Hopkins Med Engaging Homelessness. So I'd like to turn it over, maybe the DECA committee will have you guys go first and just share a little bit about the work you're doing. 
Katie, if I can, one thing. Yeah, yeah. There is volunteering opportunities. And then if everybody will look uh, next Monday, we will be posting all of our fellowship opportunities. Um, and there are other job. There are two new positions coming out of our climate work. Uh, so as people are looking, uh, you know, and, and a lot of our volunteer positions also give people really good exposure about the work culture environment etc so maybe uh, really quick ruth ann did you want to talk about the new uh, this new climate work really quick just to give people sort of an overview yeah of what i mean we're so is. super excited uh the climate imperative uh which uh is made up of some of the leading uh funders and voices on climate uh, work across the country has given us money to incorporate into our work a uh, gas stove and uh, ga uh, gas appliance removal uh, and to move homes to electrification. Uh, we will be studying uh, the respiratory impacts and the economic impacts of this because part we want to do is make sure we have the right policies in place that we don't, by unintended consequence, electrify uh, homes, right? And cause the cost to go up without there being an on-ramp uh, to absorb the climate changes, um, but it is going to give us an opportunity to look across the country at this impact of decarbonization on health. And uh, there is just, it, but it, we look at it as also this broadening the opportunity to improve housing holistically, um, improve the value, the health of housing holistically because no home that we will touch will we walk away without also doing lead hazards, the um, trip and fall or the asthma hazards, right? Um, and, and in part of this, we are going to team up, I think, with the Bloomberg School of Public Health to also add cool roofs um, to our work as part of the climate work and look at the impact there. So uh, please go to our website. Next Monday, we'll be posting a number of these new positions uh, on that. So exciting. Lots of work to come. All right. Uh, Paula, did you want to speak up, or you and Sarthi, for a few minutes? Maybe we'll have Hayonu and um, Pritham or with Hopkins Med Engaging Homelessness, if you want to go first. Yeah, definitely. Uh, thanks for having us, Katie. Um, so hi, everyone. My name is Pritham, um, and I am one of the student leaders of Hopkins Med Engaging Homelessness, along with uh, my colleague, Hanu. Uh, we are a group of students from the School of Medicine, just trying to understand what more we as medical students in the future uh, positions can do to better understand this issue and understand how, from a healthcare perspective, we can better support uh, individuals suffering from homelessness. Um, and Hanu, would you like to sort of briefly go into um, our current pro like our, our current initiatives? Yeah. So right now we have um, sort of three initiatives that we are looking at. Um, one, we're hoping to go out into the community and provide some resource packets. Um, and we've received a grant from the Alumni Association to do that this summer. So right now we're like creating the packets, working with um, one of the other organizations that helps with translation or interpretation. So um, we're going to provide them in Spanish this year as well, because um, that's something that we were missing last year. Um, and we're going to hand those out this summer, hopefully. And um, then we also have an initiative that we're sort of trying to, I guess, trying to augment the educational aspect or the, the curriculum aspect of our um, you know, education to involve topics that are more pertinent and relevant to um, the homeless population. So things that we're looking at are trying to create a workshop for medical students to get involved early on in their career um, and learn things about like how to communicate with those experiencing homelessness, um, typical exam findings and things that um, are maybe more, you know, you should be more sensitive about when working with people in the homeless community. Um, so we're hoping to connect with faculty and try to create like a hands-on workshop for that. 
um, as well as just like connect with the community or connect with the physicians that are specialized and working more in um, homeless healthcare and trying to connect with them and try to get more opportunities like shadowing and um, maybe some like pop-up clinics and trying to figure out a way in which we can get the student body a little more involved with um, homeless healthcare. And then Pritham, do you wanna maybe finish off with the um, community engagement aspect? Yeah, so one sort of relatively newer thing we're trying to do um, with HMEH is uh, work with local community partners to better uh, you know, understand the local landscape of the issue and what we can actually do, um, you know, actively to support the community. So it's really exciting to be part of this panel and understand what organizations like uh, Green uh, Healthy Homes are doing. Uh, and hopefully we can collaborate with different CPOs um, across Baltimore uh, and, uh, and better engage with this issue. Wonderful, thanks so much. And Paula. Hi, everyone. Um, I am the VP of Diversity, Equity, and Community Affairs from Student Assembly at the School of Public Health. I'm very excited to be here co sponsoring this event. Um, Deka is also very passionate about this topic, along with topics regarding um, diversity and equity in our uh, community and community affairs, not only in the um, School of Public Health, but in Baltimore City. Um, some of the things we have done so far, although my position is new, I can tell you some of the things we've done so far and some of the things we would like to do. And um, one of those was we have started to take action uh, with the crisis in Ukraine and we prepared a vigil this past Saturday um, where we highlighted a lot of the organizations where people can donate to. Um, and we have also received ideas from the Ukrainian community to compile a list of our representatives um, in Baltimore. So students who are not able to help by donations to talk to their representatives and um, as the government to um, send more humanitarian aid and do more. Um, we are also preparing a panel at the end of this month about uh, research into women's health with faculty from the department. And um, we are also gonna plan a headshot event where we are gonna invite some organizations who work with the homeless community. It's essentially a headshot for a headshot. So we wanna highlight these um, organizations who help the homeless population um, uh, get jobs. So these are some of the things we are gonna do. And um, we are also gonna work for our student community. We are planning to set up monthly a space where students can come talk to us, um, the DECA committee and they can talk about any problems and concerns they have regarding diversity or equity. So we can talk to people in the IDEA office and faculty to tackle these issues and um, just better help the communication between the students and community. So if you wanna help with any of this, or you're interested, we are very much happy to have you on our team. Thank you so much. Two awesome student groups doing great work. Um, Ruth Ann, we have a couple more questions for you before we sort of wrap things up. Um, unfortunately, our other speaker sends her regards, some techno technology issues, so we'll just roll with it. Um, if you could provide, wondering if you could provide an update on the 1000 unit project and where we're at with that in the city of Baltimore. Um, we are waiting on a decision around ARPA funding and a Senate uh, earmark uh, to uh, do the formal launch. We should know by the 11th of March on the Senate earmark. Uh, we will start uh, in April, regardless. Uh, HUD has given us money to start the project. ProMedica is in. Uh, we do have a proposal in front of Johns Hopkins itself to uh, do as other institutions have done, uh, give through either anchor investment or hospital community benefit investment. That proposal is for $100 million, $10 million a year for 10 years as part of the anchor investment in this uh, community. Um, but we are proceeding uh, with this starting in April uh, and the footprint is East Baltimore to model this out uh, in the uh, complete holistic manner that includes uh, climate and uh, healthy housing. 
Um, and then we, uh, want, we are working with the city to be able to replicate this as a standard of how we work across the city to, um, so we do a comprehensive health and housing assessment that looks at both the residents uh, and their physical health and the supports needed there and the structural health of the house and working those uh, together. So that starts uh, in April to on the counting of those thousand units. But as I said, it's also not the only work we're doing in Baltimore or in the Baltimore region. It's just that that particular set of thousand homes grew out of a project that Josh Sharstein and I worked on together uh, to create a plan called Breathe Easy originally. Uh, but we decided to bring it to a more holistic standard um, and adding in the, the larger work. And, uh, but we will be evaluating it specifically for racial equity impact, um, economic human uh, impact, as well as opportunity pathways created, uh, health impacts and uh, other impacts that uh, we believe should be measurable in every program as a model to do that. Um, so I hope that answers your question on that. Yeah. And then the next one, how have you seen, so you've mentioned several sort of collaborations with other big cities. How have those collaborations come about in recent years? Well, we're starting to see kind of big money, right, happen. Uh, but GHHI actually was, there was the coalition in childhood lead poisoning. And then we, uh, we were invited to go and meet with the Obama administration based on a paper that I had written in 2008 talking about the need to address energy efficiency along with uh, lead and healthy housing because we felt it was an underlying factor of housing stability and health. Um, so President Obama gave us a, a grant to expand our work to become the Green and Healthy Homes Initiative to encompass that idea of holistic housing. Um, and what we have seen is uh, a lot of changes happening federally that now are going coming down locally. Uh, so one of the big uh, changes that came about from our work was the alignment of weatherization and healthy housing working together. In fact, uh, HUD had crea has created a direct grant program modeled after GHHI, but we, we are seeing that happen a great deal. Uh, we see big movement happening in places like Detroit, where we're having big foundation investment along with state and city in greater collaboration. And to some degree, uh, a lot of our work has advanced uh, while, while we have probably the best lead laws in the country here in, in Maryland and the work that we've done there has been stellar. The larger work on aligned housing condition investment, uh, Baltimore's probably not leading that. And that's one of our focuses that, you know, we're doing um, really fantastic movement in places like Detroit, Chicago, Cleveland, that, uh, you know, we're here, we live here, this is our home. Uh, so we have redoubled our efforts to try to, to light a fire under alignment. Um, and I think it really uh, is critical that as people here think about their future and potential work in housing and environment and climate and health, um, that we've got to be pushing for that to work uh, in a aligned fashion. Families shouldn't have to go hunt and peck for different grants to solve things. We need holistic solutions. We need to spend less time wearing people out, more time investing on what needs to get done. You know, um, if we just put the $170 billion that is necessary to really eliminate lead poisoning in the home as a major public health threat, uh, we'll say $50 billion a year, so the payback happens very quickly, right? But think about the fact that kids won't have that brain damage uh, that, uh, and cognitive impairment and what that means to a lifetime, just that alone. Um, and we know that we have, to get, we have to do these things if we want to solve the problems. Otherwise, we'll band-aid it for the next 10 generations. And if we want to be serious about racial equity, we want to be serious about opportunity, it has to start at home. And uh, housing has to become a forefront of healthcare and climate investments. And we have to, 
demanded to happen. And, um, and everybody has to stand up to the thousand statements put out on racial equity to actually do something tangibly. And this is uh, one that we think can be tangible. Yeah. Um, and then I think our last question, the best for last, what has been your path into this work and what would be your advice for a public health student interested in developing a career in sort of the housing and environment space? Big question. Yeah. Um, so I may be the worst example at this because I don't have a couple. <laughs> um, but I would tell you that um, I think coming out of COVID, people understand that public health is critical to almost everything we're doing. The number one thing that I spend my time on right now are all the major climate groups who are desperate to understand health at the community level, how they align with health. How do we uh, project out the health savings? Uh, I am an economist by training. Uh, I come out of the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. I only have a BA degree. I was in investment banking um, and that, uh, uh, but I'm, uh, I, I was tutoring kids uh, at the Franciscan Youth Center in Baltimore who were struggling to read, who were struggling in school. And uh, the more that I visited and had dinner at their home with their families and saw the condition, um, the more that it deeply bothered me. So I joined uh, the Coalition on Childhood Lead Poisoning in 93 as its first employee. Uh, they asked me if I would stay on for at least a year to help formalize, create a nonprofit, expand the baseline of the work. I said I'd do it for two. Uh, that was 29 years ago. What has kept me engaged is a constancy and consistency of being engaged at the community level um, and being able to listen to what and see and experience with families, what are their barriers and be committed to public policy that directly addresses that. Um, I'm proud that we have long given voice to our clients. That's who we work for. Um, it is, we work for the original parents, right? That set out on this mission. And uh, my advice is number one, find what your passion is about and where you can have impact. Impact is the thing that is for me uh, worth everything, seeing a real change. Uh, so it's been very selfishly, I have stayed in this work because I've seen lead rates drop by 99%. I've seen the ability to make changes. <clears throat> Don't forget to ask for what is needed by common sense. We um, get that, we are able to achieve um, things by just being straightforward, not being uh, assuming barriers, assuming that we can't get things done. Uh, times like that should be over, need to be over. Uh, document what is needed um, and make the case. Tell the, tell the human story along with the data um, and uh, really drive by passion, by need. Uh, but you can't solve problems of poverty, low-income communities, under-resourced communities, unless you're led by the communities. And uh, never mistake that because um, that's been part of the problem in America is that we think that we can uh, apply solutions and what we no normally apply is disregard and disinvestment. Um, we have to go to the hardest problems and we have to look there to make change. And be willing to do it. So look, you're in public health. Public health is courage and live your courage. So that's, uh, and the courage of common sense. And, uh, and we need people who are on fire about this and will make big change. Amazing advice. Thank you so much for being here. Um, if anybody was, came today hoping to hear from Dayspring, please put your name also in the Google Doc that is at, shared in the chat. And I will be happy to facilitate a connection with the director for you. Um, if you're interested in GHHI, also put your information in and we can get you connected. Um, and their, their website is there as well. Um, 
let's let me share my screen quick. And as always, please feel free to connect with Source. Keep up to date on everything that's going on via social media. Our handle is at JHU Source. Um, if you're interested in getting connected with any community partners, um, housing or otherwise, you can always email source at jhu.edu. Um, and we also have virtual office hours each week um, where myself or another staff person is, is helping to get students connected, um, depending on what your interests are, what your you know, schedules like, things like that. So we are happy to help. Um, and then one final plug, we have the Source Yearly Annual Awards. Um, several categories, um, alumni, staff, student, student groups. Um, those nominations are due March 25th. Um, and we would appreciate any nominations that you guys have so we can get those awards out. So Thank you so much, everyone, for attending today. We'll see you back in April um, for our next partner panel on a very similar topic, um, closely linked on the environment in honor of Earth Day. So thank you so much, everyone. It's International Women's Day, by the way. It uh, is, yes. Thank you for all of the powerful, powerful women uh, that will come out of this and do great things in the future. We love our men too. But uh, this is we want to focus on those uh, wonderful uh, women that uh, there's so much talent here. So thank you. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Ruthann. Take care. Stay safe. Bye.